Hello. We're live. We are. We're live. Okay. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm excited and I'm nervous for our first ever, my first ever webinar. Have you done a webinar before? I have not. So this is my first experience with um, Las Musas and moving, you know, from the live panel mm -hmm. where you have your audience mm -hmm. to this digital where I can't, you know, see everyone. <laughs> no, I know. I wish we could see everybody. All right. Well, people are starting to come in. Yeah, I see, I see that. So let's just give it another minute and then we'll, we'll start going. Oh, we have a yay. Yeah. Let's just give it another minute. Um, so for those who are here right now, we are so excited that you are joining us during this Corona apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> I think that this is a very, very unbelievably stressful time. We're all being very optimistic, but the challenges of being a parent at this time um, of being an educator, of being someone who's an administrator, of somebody who's working at, at home and, and has a whole different dynamic going on right now. You know, I personally have my children downstairs. Um, my husband's running in from administrating to come here and help. So how's it going there, Natasha, in your in your? Uh, it's we're running a, a co work space in a daycare at the moment. Um, in my home, I'm trying to write a book with a five month old. So, uh, and just like generally trying not to be so anxious that I can't function. Yes. And I, and I want to like throw out there as all of us are experiencing this kind of anxiety. Cause again, I'm trying to write, you know, you and I have texted, we're trying to write our books. Mm hmm that when we oh, come to this cool. so wait i just want to shout out we have we have charlotte north carolina we have miami here we have san francisco we got new york carla hey <laughs> i'm so excited in virginia yeah so yep, yep. exciting yeah we're all coming in yes 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 but canada. again canada oh my gosh ontario hi jackie i hope i said it correctly <laughs> so okay i think I think we should get started. Okay. Okay. So the, the first thing we want to do is what we're doing, which is to get, oh my goodness, Guadalajara, um, is to find out where you're from. Go ahead and throw up on that chat box, you know, where, where you are all coming from. And also um, Natasha is going to throw up a, a, a quick poll to, to see how you're identifying if you're coming in as a, as a teacher, as a, as a, you know, as a teen, as a writer, other, what, however um, you want, you're coming to this workshop. There's yep. Tiffany from Massachusetts. All right, so the poll's up. So just let us know. However you identify if you're a teacher and a writer, but you want to identify as writer, whichever, just so we have a, a sense just of who's in the room with us. Because more than anything, we just want this to feel like a conversation. I, I know I'm personally starved for human interaction, and we wish we could see you, but at least this way we're getting to know you a tiny bit more. Yeah, I feel like uh, I'm, I'm empathizing with a lot of teachers right now because I know as a teacher myself, you know, it's it would be very difficult for me to do a class where I can't see and walk around the classroom and interact with the with the with my students. So as far as me, um, my name is Nonica Ramos, and I am the writer of The Truth Is, and and I wrote also uh, the Disturbed Girls Dictionary. That was my debut. And this is the one that I'll be focusing on today, although both have intersectional characters. And Natasha? Uh, my name is Natasha Diaz. Uh, my debut YA, Color Me In, came out in August. And I'm trying to write a second book, but for right now, this is all I've got. Oh, you're making tons of progress. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so right now it's looking based on the poll. It's looking like we're we're mostly writers. Amazing. We've got some teachers in the room. We've got uh, and we've got some others. So oh, we got an editor too, Caitlin. Yeah. So that's exciting. I'm gonna leave the poll up just for one more minute. If anybody else trickles into the room, um, and then you know I'll I'll end that and then we'll keep it moving. But one other thing we just want to mention is. Uh, we have this chat box. It's it's the way that we can all interact with you since we can't see you. So feel free as we're talking to throw a question up into the chat box. And if uh, we don't 
get to it or we miss it because there's too many, feel free to throw it up again. We're also gonna reserve the last 10 minutes or so of this webinar for Q&A. So if we don't get to it, ask us again, but we're gonna do our best to, um, to address the questions as they come in. Absolutely, absolutely. So Natasha, would you mind starting mm -hmm. off by reading a piece of your work? Sure. Okay. So I just, I just ended the poll. So it seems like we're, we're mostly writers here, which is very, very exciting to have. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about Color Me In. It is an uh, own voices book in the sense that I, I wrote for my own experience. I'm white presenting, but I'm also multiracial. My mother is a first generation American. Uh, my grandfather was from Liberia, West Africa, and my grandfather, my grandmother is from Brazil. Um, I am also very white and my father is Jewish. So I am Jewish and multiracial and white presenting. And I wrote a book about what it is to sort of grow up with, with that sort of multifaceted identity. And, um, this passage, so we, when we advertised this, we said we were going to be reading a poem. So in, in Color Me In, the main character, Nevaeh Levitz, she has never really engaged with either side of her identity, um, her biracial blackness or her Jewishness. She's just sort of lived in a world where she's been very sheltered and sort of just allowed to be white. And she's never really dealt with what it means to be Jewish or to be black and her parents separate. And she and her mother move in with her mom's black Baptist family in Harlem in New York after she's grown up in the Burbs. And she uh, is sort of confronted for the first time with the fact that she looks white, but she is black. And what does that mean? And then her family, her this part of her family that she doesn't know very well is, is Christian and Baptist, but she's Jewish and she's more culturally Jewish than she is religiously Jewish. Um, so anyways, this passage is uh, sort of the first time that she gets an opportunity to feel like she's a part of her black community. Um, it's when she goes uh, to the Juvere uh, Festival, which is the West Indian Day Parade in Brooklyn. Traffic is crazy for a Monday at 2.30 a.m. The highway is packed and my cousins are super hyped. They dance to music and wave their mini flags out the window to honks and cheers. It takes us almost an hour to get to Brooklyn and then we have to park a 15 minute walk from Eastern Parkway, which is apparently where everything goes down. Walking through the streets, I can taste the energy. It's like pop rocks and electricity, like those sparklers you get on the 4th of July to write words that melt into the sky. People cheer and some of them yell, Jamaica, at us in solidarity and recognition. My mom walks stiffly through the crowd, the only person out of thousands wearing a simple white t-shirt and jeans. What is this, I ask, motioning to the crowd around us. The Juvere Festival, it's the kickoff for the West Indian Day Parade, Zeke says, guiding me forward gently as if this were my first ride without training wheels. Juvere means daybreak. It's a chance for us to wake everyone up with our pride. Just enjoy it and stay close, okay? My uncle puts his big arm around my shoulders. Under the streetlights, all I see is brown on brown on tan on yellowish golden on brown, and it's breathtaking. We flood the pavement with a confidence that screams out into the universe. We are powerful. We are beautiful. We deserve to be celebrated. The air is filled with incense and sounds that I take in with deep, full breaths. As I drink in the delight, a transformation takes over, one that is sudden and brave, swift and loud, as if until this very moment, I have lived confined to a two-dimensional outline, waiting for a chance to be whole. So, uh... Myra just said, let's see that book cover. So uh, <laughs> so what happens in the book is because Nevaeh is sort of coming to terms with herself and all of her diff the different aspects of her identity, she has a difficult time expressing it. Uh, so what she does is she, write po she writes poems. So in that chapter, uh, that last section that I wrote was actually, it switched from her sort of being in the moment to her being in her head and um, sort of, that's the way that she navigates coming to terms with her identity, taking ownership of all the aspects of it, um, including her privileges, which we will get to at, at a later point in this chat. Uh, but yeah, so I think now we're going to get a little reading from Noni. <laughs> so in the truth is my character is 
coming to a very rocky journey of wokeness, which is never, ever a destination, but is always a journey. And so in this book, my character, Verdad, she is someone who is a marginalized person as a Puerto Rican person. But she is someone who, even as a marginalized person, still perpetrates aggressions against others. And so what my book deals with is this idea that we all, because we have all been drinking from this poisoned well, because we have all been subjected to an entire system where racism has infected every portion of it, been affected by it ourselves. So even as woke as we 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 may be because of our family, our upbringing, or the or the the blessings of having educators who have brought in curriculum, in addition to the tainted curriculums that the kids have that are lacking, um, we still cannot understand the full picture of what our brothers and sisters and siblings are going through. So for me to sit here, I could never fully appreciate and understand Natasha's experience unless I listen to Natasha, unless I educate myself on, on her journey. And even then it will be limited. And so as Verdad is going through her journey, she's starting off as someone who is grieving over having experienced a mass shooting. Her friend Blanca was murdered in a mass shooting in a theater. Um, and she's coming on the one year, but that is coming on the one year anniversary and she's entering school again and she has PTSD. And in this experience, the world doesn't stop. There's no breath for her. There's no time to postpone all of the stresses, the normal stresses of being a teenager, of all of the normal stresses of developing your identity. And so she comes into school in this state, like all of our kids do, they come into school with so many stresses that we don't understand or identify. And she's confronted with the normal situation of being attracted to somebody, you know, but she finds out that this person that she's attracted to is trans. And so this disrupts her understanding of her own self and takes her on a journey where she has to understand her own sexual and gender identity. So she's facing the idea of, am I someone who's a gay person, but am I also homophobic at the same time? And so all of these things are going in our head. So at the section that I'm gonna read in the book, you might hear, you will hear Blanca being named. Blanca is actually a ghost in the story in the sense that she is a presence in Verdad's mind, but she's already passed on. And at this time that she's reading, she's coping with her own PTSD and the normal situations going on in, in, in her mind over her dad um, and her own sort of um, lack of ability to be really human because she's she's been so hurt. So I'm gonna start off now. According to my mother, there is nothing I can't do, but I know better. I can do quadratic equations, but I can't figure out how to be a human, except like this, holding my violin. The violin, like the coffin, is hollow, empty inside, but the emptiness is integral to its purpose. Emptiness is space of such sacred design that only death and music can fill it. Blanca, not speech. Speech is just clutter, thoughts scribbled sloppily by the tongue. Thank you, Blanca, I say, note to self, write that shit down. The audience before me is silent, surprised. I can never cry through my eyes, but I can do it through my fingers. Sadness is something I read like sheet music. The auditorium is full, but as always, I play for the empty seat in the house, my father's. This fact I know breaks my mother's heart. I mean, imagine that shit. You bust your ass as a single parent and your kid treats the absentee parent like a rock star. But love is like water and it slides over the smooth places, sinks into the cracks. My father not showing up is probably better than the real thing. This way, the father I imagine high beams a smile and sheds a tear on cue. He apologizes for not being there for every show, for every moment my mother tried to fill, but only a father could. Emptiness is the fullest thing there is. A best friend can't fill the emptiness, but she can carry it with you. And Blanca, my Blanca would go the distance, even uphill. Blanca shows up and plants herself in my dad's seat. She and her bow she's using as a conductor's wand, her big ass cherry slushy that's splattering all over her leotard and white off the shoulder fuzzy sweater, Blanca. She was the black swan, the swaggering ballerina. She could play the violin like an electric guitar. 
She danced hip lay. She pissed every teacher off because she refused to follow directions. She was a trial and error kind of person. She broke shit. But when she figured things out, she understood things better than the person trying to school her. She was intuitive, everything I could never be. Now I play for her, for Blanca. The air is a low tide and the notes of my violin stud the sand with whorls and wings of shells. The audience scoops up sea glass with their buckets, but Blanca dives in after the lucid conch and disappears. Someone walks out of the waves and takes her place. I blink. My posture, the position of my bow, fingertips, my elbow tells you nothing. But if you measure my heart rate, my brain waves, you know something happened. That people got up out of their seats to make room for someone who showed up late. That someone is Danny, sitting in their cave, listening to the music come from mine. Really listening. Not the kind of listening most people do where they say, damn, I wish I could do that. Or damn, I never knew that loser could do that. Or that girl's on the right track for college the real kind of listening, the kind of listening that makes you come out your cave. Danny's hoodie slips down. I blink, I bite my lip, but my fingers don't waver. They continue to play mathematically, solving note after note. Even when I do the unthinkable, I look through the force field of blinding purple light straight into Danny's eyes. For a moment, I play for them. And so, <laughs> In that scene, this is the first time she sees uh, that she and Danny have made a connection and it's gonna start to get to the, the next level real, real fast. Um, and so th this is where she's going to deal with what a lot of our kids are dealing with, wherein she's trying to formulate who she is and trying and falling in love. And, and that's not in isolation. She's gonna have to deal with her mom and how her mom's gonna react to her being queer, to her being, uh, attracted to somebody who's trans, she's going to have to deal with what that means as a Latinx person, um, where uh, I know I myself experienced a lot of, of intolerance and homophobia growing up, where that was just part of the culture, and I didn't even know to question it, you know, as a young person. And so this idea of how do you change, how do you, how do you grow when you're in that poison well and you're swimming in it? How do you come up for air? And of course, the answer is the teacher's. The teachers have to bring these kinds of texts, like Natasha's text, into the classroom because that's going to be where we give the kids that pure water to drink, where they're going to be illuminated. And, and also the writers, everyone here who's a writer, you're going to bring it, you know, with your, with your work. When you're writing these characters that are uniquely, authentically stories coming from your experience and your research, that's when we make the changes that, that we're all here to do in ourselves and, and, and in our classrooms and in our work. So, um, yeah. yeah. So uh, we wanted to break up this uh, webinar a little bit. We're going to um, do a quick meditation because right now the world is on fire and uh, Noni is really brilliant at this. So we are just going to pause for a moment to do a quick anti-racist meditation. Uh, we have our candles. I have um, our president, Beyonce, here. Love it. And I have my giant wand. I don't know if any of y'all are at home. <laughs> and you have your fire. However, you're bringing your fire. I have my rainbow candle, my beautiful Rainbow Candle. And I also brought James because we love our James. So we've got the old school and the new school. Mm -hmm. And so what? before I start the meditation out there for all of you, if when I'm speaking, you want to keep your eyes closed, if you want to keep your eyes open, if you want to throw up your, your own med meditation or, or intention, however you comfortably feel I'm labeling that, and you're like, this is something I want to throw out there. This is this is the temple of illumination as far as wherever we're coming from. We're all here to grow. As I heard Natasha speak, I'm like, wow, you know, we're all growing from each other. So with that, I'm gonna light it, light it up. Yeah. <laughs> and and hopefully, like, yeah. All right, James, give me some fire. Okay, all right. And I also brought crystals. I'm gonna cleanse us all. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> we're all coming here today as educators and as writers and as people who want to grow in community, even as we feel like we're locked down, we have each other. So today we ask for the blazing and the fiery light of introspection, reflection, and self-evaluation are a collective art. 
the art of storytelling, the art of education, the art of community. Universe, take away our serenity dream. Bless us with discomfort, discontent, and disruption to open our eyes and see injustice to our brothers, sisters, and marginalized siblings. We ask that with this light, we set fire to false narratives and co-opted and colonized histories. That in these raised fields, we respect our marginalized sisters, brothers, and siblings as they unearth the truth and their truth, reconnect with their roots, recover and raise their own stories and damn well believe them, period. Give us the fortitude to engage in our own emotional labor and self-education and experience to unlearn and uproot invasive and entrenched systems of racism whose tentacles choke our ability to acknowledge our privilege. Grant us the courage to decontaminate ourselves from the masterminded plague, pestilence, and perpetrations of homophobia, sexism, misogyny that infiltrate every aspect of society. Give us the wisdom that comes with listening and shutting the fuck up. The enlightenment that comes with asking forgiveness, but knowing sometimes we don't deserve it and we aren't owed it. And the comfort of knowing that in our discomfort, we are creating art that illuminates and guides our youth on their journeys of self-discovery. And we'll leave this lit. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you, Noni. And if anybody else, as I said, wants to throw their own thoughts up here, please do. Please do. Yeah. Um, so we want to move on to actually breaking down intersectionality. So the first thing we're going to do is really quickly, we're just going to have a poll up to see just basic history behind the term. So who coined the term? Just put it out there. I'll, I'll read off sort of what our what it looks like our answers are, and then we'll sort of break it down further. Okay, I'm just going to give, just going to give a minute. All right, it looks like everybody here knows what they're talking about. So okay. the answer is correct, Dr. Crenshaw. Uh, she is a lawyer and also a philosopher and an expert on um, race and gender theory. Um, for It seems like everybody here has at least some sense of intersectionality, but just to do a, a brief overview, the term uh, is sort of coined to discuss the intersection between race, class, sexuality, and gender as they apply to groups or individuals and the overlapping systems of discrimination and disadvantages that then affect those groups or individuals as a result. Uh, the reason in writing, especially for young people and also educating for young people that we keep this in mind is that we're not only speaking to the experiences that we individually have uh, and we're aware of the fact that some people are getting microaggressions and macroaggressions from multiple parts of their identity. So in um, Color Me In, what I was attempting to do with Nevea was to both um, confront and um, break down the uh, complicated existence of being someone who is multiracial um, while also not ignoring the fact that she's white presenting, which means that her experience as a black person is very different than visibly black people. And she does still deal with microaggressions and that she also deals with prejudice of being anti-Semitism, of being Jewish. And how do you sort of, um, how do you handle all of those different issues and also recognize the privilege at the same time? Um, so in terms of just the way we can talk about this in, in characters is I think to take from the experiences that you may 
have, like if, if you want to take a moment and then Noni's actually going to, to run an exercise about this, a uh, writing exercise. But if you want to just take a moment right now to think about whether it's a character you're writing or yourself, whichever you feel more comfortable with, and try to consider all aspects of their identity in their intersections. And, um, and then I'm going to have Noni take it from there to move on to the actual writing exercise. Okay. Just a moment. So <clears throat> with the writing exercise, if you all have pen and paper or, you know, I'm not sure how that would work on the keyboard if you're on it, but I'm not a tech person, <laughs> but this is at your own pace. So we're going to throw up in a little bit the, uh, or now. I'm sorry. Um, I just heard it. You're all good. Yeah. Yeah. You've got this. These exercises are yours. Um, I'm going to go over them just the way that I would with a classroom. And so basically, I know if I'm sitting in front of my classroom, or I should say standing because I, I actually never sat, there will be some kids who are going to start writing on the paper before you even start the directions. That's okay. There are going to be some kids who are doodling as they're thinking, right? So for all of us, you go at your own pace. I'm going to go through it. If you want to start writing right away, that's great. If you want to just listen through and then write on your own, it's whatever works for you. So the first thing I want to start off with is the idea of empathy. And I have a quote here and it, it says, quote, I've been walking on fire and ice across nails and through snakes. And here you are wanting to walk in my shoes when I've been barefoot up till now. And I want you to kind of think about that and think about this sense of what that means as far as empathy is concerned. Empathy is understanding to the extent that we can understand what someone else has been through, but it's not taking someone's story. So for example, 99% of the time, if we're not black, we're not writing a black main character. And I'm gonna explain that in a minute. If we're not trans, we're not writing a trans main character. So for example, and the truth is, I do have a character that's very important. Danny is a trans character. And originally when I conceived of the book, I actually started writing in their voice. But I realized that that's, that was not, that perspective was not my story to tell and that I had more to offer as an outsider because I am an outsider, I'm not a trans person. So I have more to offer from the perspective of what her dad is going through and processing what that means for her as she's falling for this person. Um, and so to start off with um, the exercise, think about yourself as being enough. Your story, if you're writing from Guadalajara, your story is more than enough and we definitely don't have enough stories about that. If you're writing a story and and let's say that that you're you're not um, you know a person of color, it, you have a story, and 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 this is something that you need to be to be researching. What is your unique story to tell? You are enough. Your story and perspective matter, especially if you're a marginalized person. But also, I think it needs to be kept in mind if you're not a marginalized person, you still have a unique perspective to tell. And not making a main character out of a marginalized person doesn't mean we're not inclusive and don't have them in our stories. So for the first thing, when you're writing and you're looking at your piece of paper or you're just meditating, what do you own? Who are you on your own? And that is up to you. Jot down some stuff right now as you're sitting there at home. Jot down the first words that come to your head. It Maybe you're a dancer. Maybe it doesn't have to necessarily do with ethnicity or culture. Maybe the first thing that comes to your head isn't that. For me, when I think about that, as I wrestle with my own um, Boricua identity, as somebody who is not first generation, my, my great grandmother brought us over. Okay, and as somebody just thinking about my privilege, right, as someone very different from someone who lived and grew up on the island and how it is that I choose to respect that difference, maybe what well, I'm writing that down. And Verdad's struggles are very much that. She tries to figure out who is she as, as a Puerto Rican with Puerto Rican descent. Um, but for you, maybe that has to do with your job. Maybe that has to do with what, uh, what you, who you are in your community. And so jot down a whole list of that stuff. And then after you do that, um, you can go on if you're ready, because maybe you're like, nah, I'm going to take a minute to jot on all these things. Maybe you're going to put down I'm a cook. It can be anything that you're super passionate about. It does not have to have, there's no right or wrong answer. So then I want you to think of whatever that list is, whether that's, a, whether that's a dancer, whether that's a cook, maybe you put down writer and maybe that's, maybe you put down teacher, maybe you put down the combo. Okay. Maybe you put down someone who's struggling. It can be phrases. Maybe it's, maybe you put down somebody who's dealing with anxiety or OCD um, or that is dealing with those things, you know, and maybe part of your identity has to do with mental illness. 
hey, whatever you put down, start thinking of breathing soul into that that person, that that identity. So what might be the struggle of that person? So if you're if you put down that that you identify as, as somebody who is a dancer, I'm going to pick something that seems like kind of to the side. What is the struggle? What is the struggle with that? Is your dancing connected to to romance? Is it connected to someone you want to be with? Is it connected to your cultural identity? Is it connected to your ancestry? What might be a struggle with that? It, you know, that's what I, I, I want everyone to think about. As we, I know, as I think about when I'm writing my characters, I'm thinking, what are they feeling? What are they struggling with? You know, and then what I have next is I want uh, to imagine that character in a variety of places. So as you're jotting things down, think about if you have this character, whoever this character is, so for me, it's for that. I might, as I'm practicing and I'm trying to think of how to write her, kind of picture her in different genres. What would Verdad be like? I'm writing realistic fiction, but what, what might Verdad be like in a picture book? You know, what might Verdad be like in a dystopian story? What might she be like if she was just writing a dramatic monologue? Maybe Verdad right now, would be writing a dramatic monologue and dealing with this 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 shutdown that we have now. And Verdad's mom is a nurse, so she might be thinking in her dramatic monologue, what is it like when my mom is out there on the front lines and she's definitely not safe? Verdad might thinking might be thinking about she's deaf. She might be wearing trash bags. Not everybody in the hospitals, as you guys all know out there, have what they need to take care of themselves. So maybe she her monologue would be about worrying about her mother. So getting to know your character, and you'll see this on the list, okay? Think about as you're writing, and remember, you could be writing right now or just listening, whatever's comfortable for you. Getting to know your character, what is their mantra? What is like something that's super important to them? What are three rules that they would make if they ruled the world? I know that with Verdad, she is wanting to shut down and shut everybody out and isolate herself in the beginning. So for her, it would be very strange to finally actually have a world where everyone's isolating. But Verdad has just fallen in love. So what's that like to be in love and to isolate? Like you actually find the first person ever that you want to be with, and now you can't see them in person. Or maybe as these teenagers have their ways of getting around things, maybe she's contemplating how to get around that. So maybe you might uh, come at it from that um, aspect. Write about your character's dreams. Whatever your character's going through, do a quick jot about what they're dreaming. And if you're like, nah, I, that's a lot, that's overwhelming, draw it, bullet point it, scribble it down. Because remember when you're writing, and I know Natasha, you and I have gone back and forth when we're writing our drafts for our new books. Sometimes you're writing a paragraph. Sometimes you're writing a word. <laughs> and sometimes you're writing pages. Mm -hmm. So as, as you're going through, that, those are the kinds of exercises. And the point of those exercises is to get yourself into what uh, Natasha had mentioned earlier, own voices. My book is own voices. Okay, her book is on voices. Uh, and, and what we're trying to do is to get you authentically into your own unique story. So all those places that you guys are, are coming from or the places you've come from before you got there, you know, or what we're trying to shift you to because your power is going to come from your own story. You don't need anybody else's story. So, and I'm going to pass it to you, Natasha. No, that's great. So before we uh, move on, I, you know, I want everyone to be able to take a moment to finish if, if you are still writing. Also, it, just take a break for one second in case anybody does have a question about that ex specific exercise. Again, if you want to hold off till the end to ask questions, that's fine. But if you have any while we're in it, feel free to throw one up in the chat box and we can address it. And if not, we can we can move on to the second exercise. And again, like, we, we, we know we're moving sort of quickly. That's why we're sharing these um, files with you to have at home. You shouldn't feel any pressure to fill everything out right this moment. You can just take notes. And then if you really want to ruminate on it and fill it out later to use or just have it as inspiration for you as you go back to writing, whenever you go back to writing, all for you. So, um, okay. All right. Well, it doesn't seem like we have any questions right now. So I'm just going to really quickly, I'm going to throw up, I'm going to share the file for the second exercise, which is all about privilege. So um, the reason I wrote Color Me In is because growing up as a multiracial person, I never read multiracial characters that I could in any way um, relate to because so often I found that the perspective was, oh, here's this uh, person of mixed race who's now different within their community of color. 
and we're gonna sort it, it always came off like like light bright tears a little bit to me like it was a little bit of uh oh let's feel bad for this person that they're different than this group of marginalized people even though for most often the multiracial character was usually either lighter skinned or white presenting that is not always the case when you're mixed race multiracial biracial many times you are um a visible person of color and i personally wrote the perspective i wrote because it is my experience and i don't know the experience of being multiracial and dark-skinned but that is something that i think we desperately need in literature and those are perspectives and stories that never really get told so i'm hoping that some of you out there are writing those books um but what i always wanted was for the character to have a recognition of their privilege in comparison to the experience that their community and family that looks different has. So um, when I was writing Color Me In, talk thinking about Nevaeh's privilege was the thing I constantly came came back to over and over and over. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna stop, we got a question. If you don't write from the point of view from a marginalized character, how do I make sure to properly and rightly and respectfully address issues that I care about but I'm not a part of? So homophobia, transphobia, racism. Um, no, you wanna grab it? We can, we can, uh, <laughs> that, that could be a whole, <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful question. It's a great question. And, and it, and it's beautiful because that's something that if you're not wrestling with it, I personally find that problematic. You should be wrestling with that every single time you write. So for example, in my book, I have a Korean character. I had to make sure I was being respectful and research can involve reading definitely. Um, but research should involve also experience. I personally, for example, had an extremely close friend who was a sociologist um, and who was someone who was happy to talk to me, remembering also that it is not your friend's jobs to do your labor. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want to say every friend that we have that is not our particular culture or ethnicity is now responsible for educating us. But in this particular case, he offered to speak with me so I could make sure that I was being respectful um, and so it, it, it's a tricky line, but it, it, it's research and research can be going online and watching um, own voices, documentaries, own vo reading own voices books. Um, right now, there are tons of own voices, persons who are speaking for themselves. The key is to get sources where the persons are speaking for themselves and those resources are becoming more readily available. And then after that, my next thing would be. Um, you have to let people read you. One of the sorest spots that I have uh, for, for me is that I, I wanted to have a much bigger community of readers than I had at the time that I wrote my second book. To me, I, I'm, I'm going to be making sure that twice as many people are, are reading me um, in my process than, than, than before. Um, but I think um, that's the key is community. So I know with Las Musas, we are with each other sharing um, but um, the key is critique groups and community in the end to make sure that you haven't accidentally, unintentionally transgressed. Yeah, I also, I also just think, you know, this is life, right? Like, like discrimination, microaggressions, those happen on a daily, sometimes hourly basis to marginalized people. And so having awareness of that and just having that, uh, having your book really um, feel authentic and realistic means acknowledging that it doesn't necessarily mean having a chapter that's like, I'm going to teach you this lesson, but like in the conversations that your characters are having, that's real life. Right. And that's what young people, young people more than more than most people these days are speaking out and openly about what their experiences are with regard to discrimination and microaggressions. And I think that that's a way to really make your stories and books authentic, even if it's not, even if it's a little bit on the periphery, because it's not necessarily what your main character is experiencing, they can witness it, they can be adjacent to the conversation, and it can still have impact and 
and add more depth to the story you're telling, even if it's not what they are personally experiencing in the story, if that makes sense. Um, we got another question. Um, I can, I'm going to grab this one from Myra and then Noni, if you have anything to add. So number one, if you're going to describe skin color, you need to describe every character's skin color. If you only are describing, uh, the the characters of color skin color that means you're coming from a perspective of making the assumption that everybody else is white that that's the norm that that's that's the perspective everyone should be reading through and the lens we should be reading through i personally describe every character that comes onto the page so that we know who they are the community they come from their ethnicity their race their gender to me it doesn't and it doesn't have to be that you know straightforward but you know who this person is wholly and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um do that differently for characters of color or white characters um Noni I don't know if you have any oh, and the other uh, thing is please don't compare food of color skin to food please food. don't do that food, food. That, that's that's what I was just gonna add and I know that right now when I'm 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 working on a manuscript and I'm and I'm thinking about descriptions don't forget the poetry of describing someone's beauty, whether that's inner beauty that someone's perceiving as they're looking at someone who's a love interest or without, that doesn't, that that can be manifested in someone, someone's skin being like a the, the galaxy, you know? I think we forget that, that the beauty, ethnic beauty is not often portrayed or described, it's just starting to come to the surface. So don't forget the poetry of, 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 of that. Um, in, in, in writing your, your, all of your characters, as Natasha said, equally represented. Um, yeah. 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 And I would also say, uh, in a, just on a larger scale, mm -hmm. trying to decolonize the way we're using language, like the darkness being bad, whiteness, lightness being good, you know, having that be associated with beauty. Um, that's nonsense, right? Like, like black, and brown and tan is beautiful. Those are beautiful colors. Those are beautiful people. Those are beautiful communities and cultures. And that can be expressed on the page in a way that will change a young person's mind. If let's say they come from a household that maybe they have, you know, a, a racist uncle that they've heard one thing and this is the first time they're seeing on the page and it can open their minds and we have the power to do that with language and it's a really amazing opportunity um so another question how do we find readers is it just your friends in the communities that are that are represented um there's i feel like unlimited ways to find readers in terms especially for beta readers what noni was discussing you can be part of a collective like we are with las musas you can put a call out on twitter to the kidlit community and and see if there are people who are of a specific group. Um, there are also sensitivity readers who do this for a living, who will, for pay, read through your work and talk through aspects of a specific um, culture that you are trying to represent on the page that they are from, that they, and you are not, and that they can say, look, like, this, this is, offensive and I recognize that you didn't mean it that way but but as someone of that community um it it's hurtful and you're perpetuating a stereotype or this doesn't feel real to me I wouldn't you know and and that can be a really useful resource and you're also then helping um a marginalized person with their own business which is awesome and speaking of free you know the society of children's book writers and illustrators um <clears throat> with connections to them and Natasha you can correct me but they have connections regionally so in other words you can find groups that do critiques in your own city and right near you um and so that way you can meet with people and find resources um you know that are available to you that are you know a car a car right away um but yeah, I think that everything that Natasha said is correct. We can't write in a vacuum, okay? That idea of the cave that the writers used to be in and then they would produce these works, like that does not exist. And the writing that was produced from that cave is hugely problematic. Most of the texts that we're looking at, I can't go to the library and take out any books that are older past a couple of decades without finding massive issues in, in, in what I'm presenting my own children or my students, you know, so. Um, make sure you're you're using recent literature also mentor texts you know there are many many books and and 
um, that you can be reading like stamped and how to, how to be, an, how to be an anti-racist. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, um, what's the, uh, there's so many other ones, but anyone that come to my, to my Natasha that you can think of that people can read to help them guide them in this process. Oh, uh, this book is anti-racist. Yeah. I think it's behind me, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but yeah, so that, that community is the key and, and it doesn't have to cost anything. If, and, and there's nothing wrong with it costing something. Let me throw that out at you too. Paying somebody for doing that is the way it should be. So oh, I want to have both sides of that in there. If you don't have money, it's possible. But when we do have somebody do it and that's not somebody that's in our particular critique group, yes, we should be paying them. So a hundred percent. Um, Okay, can you explain how colorism plays into this language? Yeah, so I, f I feel like we'd maybe touch on that a little bit with talking about decolonizing the idea that darkness, blackness is evil, whiteness, lightness is good. Um, but it's also sort of in, and we can sort of circle now back to the conversation of privilege and um, how I sort of tackled it in Color Me In, um, a lot of what Nevea comes to learn is about colorism and the fact that she, in comparison to her cousins who are black um, and visibly black, who present as black, um, are treated differently as women. So here we now have the intersection of sexism and colorism. So while Nevea, as a woman, experiences certain types of microaggressions, her cousins who are black women experience much different forms of um, of discrimination um, and Nevaeh has to learn how to sort of use the privileges she has as a white presenting woman to give power and space for her cousins who don't have that privilege to have a little bit more of a spotlight, a little bit more of um, an opportunity to speak, to use their voices, to be heard. Um, so just going to really quickly run through this exercise. Same thing that, oh, wait, we have a, we have a question. Uh, I don't like the idea of limiting the older tech. I can take that, take this question. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But before I do, I thought I'd throw in there too, with dealing with one of the ways that this is strange, but colorism will come across is in dealing with things like mental illness, where it's always described as darkness. Mm -hmm. So in fantasy novels, it's the evil is dark in mental illness, you're in darkness. And while that, 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 that's one way of, of approaching that, but there are numerous ways to open up the conversations metaphorically about what it is, um, what, what that experience is like. So as far as the older, the older text, cause I'm someone who has been teaching for 15 years and I definitely, there are a ton of um, classics that I have taught myself. I definitely started off with, with core knowledge. Um, you know, I've, I'm a massive worshiper of Edgar Allan Poe and the new um, rewrite His Hideous Heart. Um, I think that what there is certainly an importance in knowing where we come from as far as where colonialism, colonized texts come from. But the lens is the issue when we're talking about coming um, as writers and able to write in a lens where we are not perpetrating the colorism. OK, we need to hear from original, authentic voices from those cultures. So for example, Island of the Blue Dolphins, that, that's not written by an indigenous person. And so it's going, to have, it's going to have a problematic nature to it as opposed to hearing those stories from an indigenous person. And so those texts do exist. And oftentimes there's the space that we have to arrive children with texts is, is limited because we give way too much room towards problematic texts rather than persons who are interpreting them being the, their, their own verses own voices, um, persons. So it's not to say that we don't ever look at classics. I mean, you know, look at how many persons have retold those. But I think it's also interesting or an, an integral to hear first person accounts and first person interpretations of those experiences from affected persons. So it's a balance. Um, but that's, again, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. It's a great question. Um, do, Natasha, do we have exercise two up? Yeah, I've put it up, but uh, let me know if you don't see it. It says that it's it says that it's up there. It's green and sharing, but let me know. And if not, I can try to stop sharing it and reshare it again if it's not showing up for you guys. And we're running out of time. Oh my gosh! I know. Um, 
Okay, you can see both. Okay, awesome. So um, just going to really quickly run through it. So in what ways does your character experience oppression? So with Nevea, she, uh, she gets it from both sides, from her um, white Jewish family. They really try to uh, shelter and silence her Black identity. They don't really have any interest in um, giving her space to explore it, to take ownership of it. They have internalized a uh, bias that they don't really want to address. Um, and they've sort of spent their whole life whitewashing her. And now that she's sort of coming into herself more, she's dealing with that in in her home with people who sh she loves and are supposed to be protecting her and helping her grow. Um, on the other side, she's also experiencing, I don't know if I would call it oppression, but she's experiencing pushback from her Black family in terms of not really feeling like she has a right to claim her Blackness if she's not also going to be claiming her privilege, which to be honest, I sort of, I don't, I, I'm not saying I agree with that, but I think there's validity to the fact that when you're in a situation or you're, you have an identity like mine, you have to, the, you can't, I can't talk about my blackness without talking about my white presenting identity. The, the two go hand in hand because I walk through the world perceived as a white person. And so that means that that is how I'm experiencing my community as well. Um, what microaggressions may your character have experienced or witnessed? For Nevea, um, she has gone to, she lives, she grew up in a white affluent suburb. She goes to a white affluent private school where she is one of the few people of color. So even though she doesn't present as that, in that community, in that world, she's othered for being biracial, even though she doesn't look biracial. And, um, she's constantly being reminded by the other students and by her family members that she's different. Um, what microaggressions may your character have committed? So that's huge because Nevea comes in to living with her mom's black family, a family that she's never really had much of a relationship to up until now in a community that she's really been separated from. And she's expecting to be welcomed with open arms to be, you know, fully um, on the same equal playing ground as everyone. And they're like, whoa, you're coming from a different perspective. You've had a different life. You walk down the street and you don't get harassed by the cops. There's an experience that she has where she and her uncle are walking down the street. Her uncle is a black man and a cop, pulls pulls them over um pulls them apart and he basically accuses the uncle of harming her because he sees a black man with a white girl which is actually something that i experienced in my own life with my stepfather um you know so it's something where she um she's witnessing microaggressions and she's also committing them within her own family because she's not um very educated about her privilege um what privilege does your character hold? There is more than just uh, racial privilege, whiteness. There is um, class privilege. There is academic privilege. There is privilege to being cisgendered. There is privilege to being straight. There are lots of different ways to recognize and to break down privileges. And I think that in literature for young people, it's really important to make sure that we're we're going through all the different ways um, that you can show differences in privilege. Faith, that's another great example. And in Color Me In, Nevea has to deal with be starting to practice Judaism as a religion in a family that's Christian. And how are those two um, faiths sort of butting heads? How, are, how are, can she own both of them? How can she practice one? Um, if your character is not marginalized, how are they an ally or how can they learn to be? We said this in the meditation, there is real power in shutting the fuck up sometimes, especially if you will come from a place of privilege. Sometimes there's a line in Color Me In that says, sometimes the best thing you can do with your voice is to listen. And I believe that wholly. I think sometimes when you have when you have a privilege, whether it's any of those privileges we just outlined and there are more that we didn't get to because again, we're trying to make sure we have more time for questions, but give, give space, give the spotlight, give the microphone to someone who isn't, like if it was handed to you, hand it off to the next person because there's a reason it was handed to you and you now have the power to do that. Um, language, that's another great one. 
in terms of privileges. Um, how might your character react to a relative who is committing microaggressions or outright racism or homophobia? Mm -hmm. That's huge. In Color Me In, um, Nevaeh is confronted with the fact that her father, even though, you know, he married a black woman and had a biracial child, he clearly has internalized bias and discrimination against black people. And part of the thing that she has to um, accept and deal with in the book is how can she um, – still have a relationship with her father now that now that she's realized this and these are real things that young people and people of all ages are dealing with in their households and if nobody knows how to talk about it it never gets resolved and sometimes it won't you're not going to change everyone's mind but if you don't even have the tools to try to talk about it and to come to come to terms with it within yourself so that you can talk about it it's it's never there's no chance for it to change. Yeah, and then um, it continues generationally. That's and right. that's that's the issue with, with the homophobia experienced in my book. But that has to make the consideration, is she going to continue with this? You know, is she going to be the perpetrator as well? We keep transferring these things. Where do we cut those off? Yep. And it's painful to cut them off. And that's what the journey is for Verdad. It's painful and uncomfortable. But that's that's what we have to go through. Um, in the rebirth, you know, that's, that's what, that's natural. Um, yeah. It is unnatural when we are always comfortable and when nothing changes and there's no flux in our thinking. So, um, yeah. wow. Look at the time. We've got like five. So before we end and um, we had offered free Skype visits um, and so um, we have a couple of winners of those and, and I and they have to be present is the complication with this, Natasha. So um, I, we, I know we can check our attendees. Yeah. Um, can you look can you look at that now? So I yeah. have the names. Yes. So if you can shout out. Um, oh, Myra's got another good question. Ah. Um, OK, so let me start off with that. So um, if Tiffany from the anti-bias Montessori's in the house, if you could just put a comment in the chat box. And if Michaela Ribeiro is in, uh, is in the house, if you could also put a little shout out in the box there. And if not, then we will have to present the winner on Twitter, Natasha, because we're okay. running out of time. Because that's, yep. that's the best thing, because we've got four minutes. <laughs> yeah. So um, Tiffany's here. Hey. Hey. All right. So we got and Tiffany. Tiffany is the author of this book is anti-racist that I called out earlier. Yes. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So perfect. And, and, and with the sky visit, if it's for you, if it's, you want to give it to a class, um, that's, that's wonderful. We, and, and so, um, yeah, I'm seeing, are you going to do a part two? This is complicated. Like we scratched the surface and we, we completely understand and know and respect that we have scratched the surface. Oh, we actually, so we can actually go over, uh, Myra saying we can go over time. So I think, oh, we don't need to rush off in five minutes if, if, if there are questions. Yeah, if there are okay. questions. Okay, thank you, Myra. I want to go back to one down here. It says, even after all this research, <laughs> did you get any criticism for anything intersectionally related in your books and how did you handle? So that's where you get real. Um, and I can address that a little bit. As far as the um, the representation, I have ca characters who are Indian characters and I have characters who have a, a Korean character. And my response has been positive from those populations. Um, my response on my my trans character, because I, I do have a very diverse cast, has, has been positive. Where I did get a criticism was for a line and the book uh, related to um, persons who are asexual or aromantic. And so um, what it is that I took from that, because it was literally a line, but still, I think that um, it was the only thing not called out in the book. Um, so as far as like the Latinx experience of this character and my own character, that isn't really even recognized by this character as far as that can exist. The idea that you're not going to be on a trajectory of fall in love, get married, no matter how many painful relationships this character as parents have had or my family has had, they still think the trajectory is you fall in love, you get married. And that is a perception that is not shared by everybody and is very flawed. Not everybody has to be on the trajectory of that's what you need to be. 
that you're not you're you're whole only if you have a partner. And so for me, when that was pointed out to me, I took it as a growing experience, and I said, you know what, I, I need to um, make sure that I just broaden my community of readers so that somebody could have said hello. You, you did you consider in that particular line? Um, I don't think that you're you you can write a book in constant fear. If you have educated yourself, you have created community and you have ex put your manuscript out there, you may make a mistake, you know? And for me, that would be the one thing where I would say, yeah, yeah, I, I, I wish somebody had called Verdad out on that because she gets called out on everything else, her anti-blackness, which is huge in the book, it's massive. And she gets called out on the homophobia, all of it, but that, no. So I would say to you as a writing technique, in addition to what we already told you about with community, um, call your characters out. If you're having a problem at a character, somebody's got to call them out for it at some point. And, and, that, and I, am a true, I know that some people wouldn't agree with that, but I passionately feel like bullshit needs to be called out. So, um, yeah, I think that we safeguard ourselves when we have community, but it does not mean that you're going to write the perfect manuscript every time. It may not. Do you have any? No, yeah. Um, so overall, I feel like I've, I also got um, – I had a pretty div diverse cast. The best friend, Stevie, is um, biracial. He's half Chinese and white. Um, I got good response to him. The love interest is Afro-Latinx. He's Dominican. Um, got great response from him. Um, the uh, A little bit of criticism I received was that um, some of the Jewish community felt that some of my Jewish characters were... Um, Ne negative or or weren't weren't um sh the best representation of of a jewish person um and i think specifically they were talking about the the father and the grandmother who who both have um are racist and my response is uh i get that sometimes it's not fun to read a character that represents your community that you feel isn't um the the way that you see your community and i think that that's fair however um i wasn't writing these characters to say these are all jewish people in fact there are other jewish characters in the book who are very different in terms of uh, their representation and their, their thought process. Um, I was writing from the perspective of being part of the Jewish community, also being part of the Black community, and having experienced racism from people within the Jewish community um, for being biracial. And I wanted to call that out as a member of the Jewish community. Um, and I think it's okay personally to, especially if you are a member of the community and you're trying to call out um, an issue that I personally think is is a, a, a rampant problem within mm -hmm. the Jewish community, especially because the Jewish community is not like all white, right? There are actually a lot of Jews of color. Um, and so if it was important to me in having this conversation about intersectional multiracial identity and multi-faith identity to, to not act like that it, those issues don't intersect in real life. Um, and so I've received that criticism. I hear it. It's everyone has right to an opinion. And um, I, I have, I've gotten similar things with because I want to support you in what you're saying. I don't feel like I that got criticized in particular in that meaning that I created problematic Latinx characters who are anti-Black or who are homophobic. But I did get questioned on it. I got questions from bloggers that I very much respect who asked me why. Mm -hmm. Why now when the Latinx community is suffering, not that the suffering is new because it ain't. Okay, but why when we're suffering, do you need to bring to the forefront a problematic right. character is what I got? And I answered it. And my answer is when we confront our, our own issues, we mm -hmm. uplift each other. That's, we uplift yeah. each other and we uplift our, our, our black brothers and sisters as well. When we come together, the oppression, it's not just that we're lifting the weight of oppression together, we're just fucking blowing it up. Okay, and so I, I can't I can't do that without my marginalized brothers and sisters. And and so um that's one of the reasons why we do need to do what we do. Now, as Natasha said, she created multitude of characters so as writers out there who are working on your craft yet don't only have 
the Latinx or the Jewish characters only be problematic, of then you're pr creating the problem. But if you also have characters that are rounded, you know, then you say, look, the community contains both. They contain people that we can admire and aspire and look up to, or people who are partially problematic, but very redeemable. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's how, that, that would be my answer to why create, as I did, a problematic Latinx character. Yeah. It also just goes back to how do you that question in the second writing exercise? How do you react to a relative, a person close to you, a teacher, um, anyone who is committing microaggressions or outright racism or homophobia or any sort of discrimination? This happens. And if it, if we're not putting it on the page as as it is in real life, how are, how can we claim to be trying to write an authentic um, anti-racist and intersectional piece of literature? Mm -hmm. That's a perfect place to close out, my yeah. friends. <laughs> Thank you all so much. This yes. was so wonderful. We're so um, grateful to have you here. Thank you for that meditation, Noni. That was Thank like, you all. This was amazing yeah. and nerve wracking, but it, it it turned out I could you, know, you could still feel the energy, even though it's virtual energy. So thank you so much, everybody, for sharing part of your, your complicated day with us. <laughs> yes, thank you. And um, yeah, we have those files up. So if you haven't uh, downloaded them for yourself, just take a minute to do that. We'll we'll hold off to to end it. Um, is the is the meditation up there, Natasha? You know what? Let me share it. I think I, I forgot to do that. Here we go. It's the meditation's there too. So if you know if you yeah, need yeah. to do a, a round two, if you wanna if you wanna get your crystals and your candles and whatever else. And slow and it down because we were, you know, moving with the pace. Please, yes. please take your time with all of it. And we're both on Twitter. Yes. So if you attended today, we're definitely, you know, if you if you have another question related to the materials, please mm -hmm. please do um, send us a you know a, a whatever, a DM. Yes, absolutely. Oh, thanks. Thank thanks. you so much, everybody. That's we very awesome. much appreciate you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. All right, everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Hope everyone's baking bread or whatever it is you need to do to stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, peace. Bye. Bye.